And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Phil, who during his near-death experience went to a realm full of the recently deceased and saw thousands of spirits and other beings that were unhumanly. Phil, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. Phil, let's start on the day that you had that NDE and go from there. Well, this happened in 2012 and I was living in the north of Dallas in McKinney, Texas. And I had a house and it was a four bedroom house with four bathrooms. Okay. So I had uh, two water heaters that comes in later in this story. <laughs> I had two parallel water heaters. So you could never run out of hot water. Um, I was home alone because I was uh, sharing custody of my children, but my children came over at least every four days. Um, but I was home alone in that house, you know, for up to four days at a time alone. So this was a period where I was alone, was in the house, and I had eaten uh, some bag salads. I was eating bag salads a lot. You know, the kind you go to the grocery store and you, the mm -hmm. dressings inside and the croutons and you just make them up. Yeah. And I was buying those a lot. I liked them. And um, I haven't bought any since. <laughs> since this experience but i remember getting sick and uh my stomach would hurt you know it was one of those sicknesses it just it was a food poisoning but it came on slowly so like i um my stomach hurt for a day and then the, by the next day i had some diarrhea and my stomach pain was getting a little harder and i wasn't sleeping well at all and i think it was on the second or third night i was just racked in pain you know it went from thinking uh i'm having indigestion maybe some pepto bismol or some over-the-counter products might help me to i may need to go to a hospital you know and so it was about midnight or so and i'd been laying in bed trying to sleep and i was rolling around and it was i don't know if you've ever had a stomach ache so bad or food poisoning where you try to be still and the pain in your stomach you have to roll around if you lay on your back it burns and then you have to roll in 10 minutes or five minutes and then you really lay on your stomach Then I would get up and walk around and lay on my back, lay on my stomach, get up and walk around, but I couldn't fall asleep. And I was exhausted and I would get up and stumble around my house. Then I went and the pain was so bad. I like to get in the shower whenever I have pain and uh, a nice hot shower is good for the body when you have, or soak in a hot bathtub when you have pain. So I got in the shower and I had a, a stand-up shower in my bathroom that was uh, had a glass door and it was just your typical size. What is it? Two and a half feet by two and a half feet, two feet by two feet. Yeah, it had to be more than that. But um, next to a bathtub and a big master bath with two sinks and a toilet and a walk-in closet in the area. It was all on this tile floor. And um, so I get in. I give you all that detail because it goes in the scenery for later on in the experience. So um, I get in the shower and I click the glass door shut on the magnet, you know, and I turn on the water and I turn it on as hot as it'll go. And I'm going around in circles like this in the water. And suddenly I had this, uh, urge to vomit, projectile vomit. And I just went, Ugh! and I hit my head on the wall, on the tile right under the shower head. And I hit it so hard that I slipped off of my toes and fell down into the shower enclosure. But when I fell down in the shower enclosure, I fell into a ball, but I was on my left side and I had my ribs uh, over the drain. and. So I looked and I could see the um, my cheek here. In fact, if you see my cheek right here, there's a line. I don't know if you can see it. It comes from this experience, but I was on my cheek like this with my ribs over the drain. And I looked at the bar, you know, those shower tubs are only about four inches high. 
four or five inches high and they had like the trimming, the brass trim. And I looked at that and I thought, don't pass out. You're going to drown. Don't pass out. And I just thought, you know, I'm laying there and I thought, oh, you'll be okay. <laughs> I was so exhausted. I could not pick myself up off of that drain. I'd been in so much pain and sleeplessness, sleeplessness that uh, I was a goner. So that's how I drowned. I wasn't drowned in that moment, but subsequently the water filled up in that little tub and it was over my head. So at that point, did you immediately leave your body? It wasn't fluid like that. What I remembered. Now, this comes to you after the experience. When you come back from a death experience, uh, a lot of times you don't remember a lot of what happened. But it appears to you later on that day or that next night. I don't know if you've had other people tell you this, but it'll start to seam itself together to where when you look back at it a day or two later, it's all one seamless memory. But when you come back, you don't necessarily remember all of it. So in the same way going out, I just remember being in this place. Uh, I don't remember waking up or anything. I'm just in this room that kind of had grayed out, um, you know, foggy walls. Kind of like an, uh, I describe it as kind of like a caviar bubble. I apologize for my camera. I <laughs> got uh, it's like a caviar bubble. You could see through the walls. I could see into other people's bubbles or spaces. And there was a man next to me who was on his bathroom floor. He was on all fours. He was naked. He was groaning in a lot of pain. There was Mine had the same surroundings as my bathroom with the tile on the floor. Uh, but the walls were like... Um, you had your own space, but if you wanted to, you could see through it out into other people. And I could hear people all around me. There was moaning and crying and sniffling and whimpering. And I heard a woman behind me that was up a little bit and she was crying. And I, I kind of knew their thoughts too. She was crying because she did not want to die because she had young ones and did not want to leave them. Uh, although I, uh, some of these people I couldn't see, but everyone was in a state of how they had just died. And I was in my place where um, I did not know that I was dead yet. Um, I had no idea. So I'm just wondering, where am I? And what is this? You know, and I'm looking around. And uh, it had the place, it was big. There were, you know, when I say there were, each person was in a bubble or space, there were thousands in all directions. Um, I wasn't really looking behind me, but I just remember looking from this way forward were um, thousands of people. And it was looked like it was going out into this blackness or darkness of space, but it was a, um, it was almost like being in an arena if you go to an arena, a concert, and they turn out the lights, you know, it's like you, you're in darkness, heading toward a light, a lit up area, it looked like up ahead, but it was like, you're going, you're in between from here to there, but you're like in a queue, you're in a large queue with a bunch of people. And you get this feeling that you're, um, you're going somewhere. Um, and it, it's starting to occur to you, uh, that these people have died. You don't, of course, include yourself. I didn't include myself in that. But um, I was looking around. And then this is where the uh, strange part comes in, was these two beings came up to my room, to my cell area, my egg. <laughs> and they were looking over the wall at me like this. and. Um, there were two of them. Now, these figures, they were, I could only see them from about the the bust. Uh, and because of the barrier in front of them, which was my space. But they were both, there were two of them, and they were both looking down at me. And uh, the one of them said to the other one, and it was telepathic. He said to the other one, um, 
What is he doing here? He doesn't belong here. Send him back to the shower. And so I remember I rose up and I literally did uh, 180, turned around, faced the other way, and I went back through uh, a light tunnel, this tunnel with all of the splendid colors of everything and energy. A, a lot of times you see depictions of that in these consciousness drawings with the, the beings made up with the chakras and all the different colors and the vibrations of each. Um, it was a tunnel of that. And I remember going into that. And then that scene ends there. Now, the beings, what they looked like, um, they were not human. I've At least I've never seen humans that look like that. And may, I haven't been to all countries. But they looked very humanish. But they looked more like what I would hear in a description of what people describe as tall whites. They were uh, hairless, they were bald, but they had very bony protrusions on the face, cheekbones. They were very thin. Their necks were a little bit longer than ours and narrower. Um, trying to think if they were wearing a garment or a robe or anything. Um, it rings a bell, but the one on my the one on my left told the one on the right on his right. You know what what is he doing here? You know, get rid of him, send him back to the shower. And so I remember being relieved because I didn't know where I was at, but I knew what the shower was. So I had just figured out that I was in the shower and now I'm here. But right about then is when they told me to leave and I turned around and went out. So that's that's uh, the first scene that happened. Do you feel like that place was some spiritual place, heavenly, or do you feel like it was some kind of like manufactured mechanical place and yeah. these beings are just were controlling you and sending you back? Yes. I felt like it was the this what we call the soul trap. Mm. And I think because I was already awake and aware in 2012, uh, I say awake, you know, I'd been awake to things on earth that happened in our lives and thousands of years before us, you know, as far as who the controllers are, uh, which who's in control, events, duality, Hegelian dialect, um, I'm not a believer in uh, mainstream news, let's say. I, I think most of your watchers would fit in the category. Certainly not all of them. Probably. But, so I, probably. So I knew already about the soul trap. And I had, through other experiences, uh, learned that uh, I no longer, uh, I don't know if I want to say this <laughs> to offend some of your viewers, but this happened to me, but I questioned resurrection and whether it actually happened or did it come from Babylon, you know, because John the Baptist was doing uh, baptisms and they, you know, it says in Romans chapter six that we're buried in him and resurrecting him into new life, right? But who was it that was resurrected and or buried and resurrected the first time after three days? It wasn't Jesus. It was uh, several figures going all the way back to the Sumerians and Phoenicians, you know. So uh, that's kind of a zeitgeist topic that I don't think we're here for. But I looked at where I was as the soul trap. And I, my best inkling of where I was at was in a queue going back to reincarnate. And it was a mechanical process, like you said, and it was, um, it's something where they, they take spirits and you go somewhere. And somehow, I guess your process to where you have to, if you were to reincarnate as someone else, it would make sense that you would have to give up your body, um, lose the shape and form of your body. Like if I was in my bubble space in that line or queue of people, uh, as myself on my bathroom floor, all of that would have to disappear at some point. And I would return to energy and become the uh, spiritual 
all that we are, which I've been also already before. Like an orb? Like an orb. I've been in that state once in an experience. That happened in 1985. Do you feel like those beings were friendly at all? They weren't menacing or um, scaring me or anything. It just looked like their job, you know. I was just another peg to put in that hole you know, just, and on the pegboard. And this peg doesn't belong. Throw it back in the shower, you know. The, the thing that I think about sometimes is um, how did they make a mistake? Like, they said they made a mistake. I didn't tell them they made a mistake. So what happened, like, was it because um, I lived a certain way as a believing, accepting follower of an organized religion, and then now I'm not because I've realized more things that are perhaps more realistic and true? Is it because I had a preconceived notion, or is it was it because they knew... Um, I was going to be able to revive myself or come back, resuscitate. Was it, I don't know, but you, it's funny kind of, because how would I get all the way up there to where I'm in the queue to go back for reincarnation? <laughs> the, the two um, beings that are running this line, this assembly line, come and check on me and they go, he doesn't belong here. <laughs> Send him back. <laughs> and I was like, great. <laughs> Maybe they realized that there wasn't enough physical damage to your body. And, right. and maybe you accidentally popped out. I don't know, but they can just easily repair you and put you back in. Yeah. Maybe it's much less work for them to do that than to start you all over in the cycle again. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, the harder jobs, are the, like water, the, the flow of least resistance would be just send it back. Right. Or we're going to have to do more work or wait or come back for him again. Right. So, yeah, that's interesting. I think. So then you eventually just woke back up in your body in your shower? Not yet. Not yet. I, um, after that, I remember now these were separate incidences like scenes. It, did you ever see the movie Inception? I'm not With sure. Leonardo DiCaprio, where he spins the top to see if he's in the real world or not. And he, he travels through different times as this van is falling off a bridge and he goes through several lives. I have not. But um, it's kind of a weak point that I'm making, but it was kind of like that where my experience was in different scenes. Okay, so this scene where I woke up in that line going to reincarnation was ended when I was told to go back through that tunnel. And when I flew through that tunnel, that ends. And I don't remember anything more about that scene. That's just where it stopped. It was very abrupt, very quick. I didn't stay there long. But then I have a completely different moment where I woke up. Uh, I just remember getting off of the floor of the shower. And I just got up on my knees. And I'm, so I'm on my knees in the shower, sitting down. Um, and I'm still, I'm going around in the water. And I remember just feeling the water go through my body. And it was hot. I put the water on really, really hot. And it was probably at least, you know, 100 degrees or close. You know. And it was going through my body. And I could feel it. The first thing I remember is it was trickling down my ribs. And I could feel it cascading down ribs on the inside of my body and it was going around my heart and it felt warm and nice to have the water going around my heart. And then I felt like my kidneys and my organs and everything stimulated on the inside of my body. And I thought, wow, this just feels wonderful. And I was enjoying it. And um, I could see things and hear patterns. Um, I remember I could see with my hands. And so I would hold my hands up and it's, uh, it's like your hands are these powerful devices that can read texture, temperature, energy levels, like every kind of meter or reader that you would ever need, your hands can do it. If we do, maybe if we knew how to power up our brain or the DNA that we're not using, uh, we could do it. But um, at least in my spirit form, 
I was just enjoying this thing. And I remember seeing patterns and I could watch all of the energies interacting. Remember how I told you in the first scene, I went through that light tunnel back to yes. the shower where I was told to go. Um, but then, so I'm in the shower. I'm playing in the water and I'm feeling all these feelings and I'm looking and I'm aiming my hands around and I'm noticing, I can't even describe everything I did or how long that was. It felt like maybe 20, 30 minutes. And um, I could see like those patterns that repeat themselves when you look into them and they, they're they called Mendelbrot where the same pattern turns into the same thing, usually like a amoeba paramecium looking thing. You seen those? I think it so. It looked like that. And then there were uh, energy waves that would come off of my hands and you could point them and they would interact with other waves or grab other energy frequencies and colors out of the, the waves that would pass through you. Do you feel like you were completely back in your body at that point? Well, I know I wasn't yet, but I thought I was. I thought I was in my body. I hadn't, that's, that's the odd part coming up is that I hadn't figured out yet. Something was odd. You know? I'm just having fun. You know, maybe it was a dream. You know, when you're in the middle of a dream, you don't stop and say, Hey, am I dreaming? And I was just enjoying this thing. It, it could have been a dream. And I, um, I remember seeing the water drops. They were going through my body from the shower head through my body and then they would hit the the water that was in the shower tub and when the water drop would hit the water surface it was splash you know that that sound <laughs> when it, that energy would come out with these patterns that would look like a fleur de lis pattern or a, a spirals would come out but you could see the water going into water and the energy that was released when those two collided and you could see the shapes they made. And I could look at each one of them and I could look at all of them. And this was with the running shower head, you know, at full speed. So, and I could see them all individually if I wanted to. I could focus on one or see all of them. And I could see in all directions. And then at some, at some point, it occurred to me, um, why is it that you can see in all directions? Um, Water's going through your body. You're experiencing water going around your heart, trickling down your ribs, and you're pointing energies with your hand and doing all these strange things. And also, why is there water in your shower? You don't even have a drain plug. Like, um, how would the shower be full of water? And um, so then I opened my eyes and I looked down and I saw this human man there i didn't recognize myself yet and um, i opened my eyes and i looked down and i saw his head over here and his he's facing the in the corner facing the glass and i looked behind and rear end and legs are over there on the other end and um there was a mess on there was a mess on both sides because i had vomited and the vomit was floating over my head and it had all collected up around my hair. The water level was up to about this high. So only this part of my head was sticking out. Uh, but there was a, a rainbow of gook and vomit around my head. It was all different colors of green and yellow and pink and orange. And uh, there were bubbles. This wall right here, they were going up my my tile, I had these four inch tiles and the bubbles were going up the tile and they'd reached up, you know, a few inches already. Um, and I don't know if that was uh, bacteria eating my hair or the, uh, I got a big bald spot, by the way, after all this, <laughs> I had to wear hats and bandanas for a couple of months. But so I'm looking down at this thing, uh, but I realized I didn't really have emotions. It didn't bother me to be like, oh, gross. Oh, what's wrong? Hey, there was no um, sense of urgency or fear. And I'm looking at it 
and I noticed in the back also, I had also had had uh, diarrhea. So, but luckily my body had kind of sealed off the two diagonally in this pool of water, sort of. Um, so it was just a mess. I'm laying there. I looked at the face and I noticed that um, I think that's me. It looks like me. And then I realized, oh, yeah, that is me. That is me. So then um, I looked out um, at my nose and my mouth, and I thought, how can I be breathing? Because you you can only breathe through your nose and mouth, and those are underwater. So I said, I'm not breathing. And that's when it hit me. That's when I just thought, oh, I'm dead. Ah, and I just tensed up and went, no. And just, just as I did that, this i just went right back into my chest just sucked right in just like uh vacuumed in just and it hurt a lot to, to be thrust back into your body and um it felt very painful so then that scene ended now I have this new scene that starts where I'm underwater and I open my eyes and I notice the water's over my eyes here and that I've drowned and I'm underwater. And I went, oh no. And I pulled myself off of the floor. And I mean, this was fast and frantic and I tumbled around and I hit the glass door open with my elbow and I tumbled out onto the floor. And I leaned back and I had my hands behind me and I just went, and I remember the um, the water was like a garden hose it's about that strength you know just coming out of my lungs and I just spit out water exhaled water uh, and I'm thinking at the same time I'm looking around at my hands and they're splashing on the floor and the floor was like um, wasn't an inch deep but close you know it was at least half inch in some places deep full of water and it had gone all the way from the standing shower tub across the bathroom to where it was um you know i had the full tub and then two sinks and then a toilet area and then to where the carpet started by the clot the walk-in closet so it was about eight or nine feet across my bathroom floor that this water had gone across already and was very thick you know so and i'm and I don't remember anything at this point when I come up. I've, all I remember now is I just woke up, I passed out, and I drowned, and I'm spitting out water. And where am I? What had this happen? What? How did I wake up? So that's that's what happened. That was an amazing accounting of your experience, and thank oh. you for sharing that. Thank you. And you had one more part that you forgot. Yeah, there was when I stood up. I stood up and I leaned on the bathroom counter and I looked in the mirror and it was scary. My eyeballs, my eyelids were sagging open. The, um, I had a big ring on my ribs with a um, cheese grater looking like a French fry cutter pattern on it or from the drain and the nubs were sticking up or my skin had been going down the drain. I was starting to get waterlogged and the, negative pressure was pulling my skin down the drain. So these nubs were almost like a centimeter or half centimeter each in this pattern. Um, yeah, it was scary. I have uh, the part that I was on on my cheek became kind of necrotic tissue that was always kind of blue and black and it, it actually became a cyst and I had it cut out. Quickly after this experience, were you healed from your stomach Food poisoning? I was. That's the other interesting part. I was, I got up and I walked around the house and um, I paced in my house for probably an hour and a half, two hours. And I just trying to figure out what the heck just happened. And I noticed the sun was coming up. So I got on my motorcycle and I went, rode to the 7-Eleven and I got some coffee. And when I walked in, the guy freaked out. This uh, the guy, a guy that I knew pretty well, Marvin, he was from uh, Bangladesh. And he, he looked up, can I help you? He goes, oh, my God. He covered his eyes. 
And he's like, I cannot look at you. What happened to you? What happened to you? And I said, is it that obvious? And he goes, you're a different color. What did you do? What did you do? You know, he, he wouldn't look at me. I was totally scared him to death. I was scared him to death. And um, I said, I had an accident, but I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> and then I just left after that. But he was like, he said, you look like you've aged 20 years overnight. Um, you're not even the same color. What, did, what happened to you? Um, so that was interesting. But I never had, I never even went to the doctor. Um, someone asked me about that. And uh, what did your doctor say? And I'm thinking, um, I hadn't been to the doctor since then. Um, I just went back to working and doing my thing. And I wasn't sick at all. The stomach sickness was gone. I was it, fine. How long after this did you start piecing it all together and the memory started coming back? Well, the first thing I remembered was being in the shower, playing with the vibrations and the colors going through me and feeling the water on my organs. And um, when I shared the experience, that's when, that's where it started. And then it wasn't until later I realized this other part just popped up in my memory. You're forgetting the whole cue and when they sent you back to the shower, you know, and so then it goes in line in perfect chronological memory sequence now, but it didn't reoccur to me in that sequence. I think you mentioned that before this happened, you were a religious person? Yes. And so how have you changed religiously afterwards? Let's see, before this, I was leaving my religion for another reason already, but... Um, because I had already stopped believing in uh, some of the basic tenets of Christianity, not any, uh, being raised as a Christian, um, some of the basic tenets, you know, like believe in Jesus, he sacrificed for you, his death. Um, people wear the cross because that's, you know, you're and you're baptized to represent the death and resurrection, if it's immersion, which even the, the Catholic baptism was by immersion in the beginning. Um, and the ones before Christianity were all immersion when they did it in Babylon um, in different countries. But uh, where was I going with that? With the um... Well, I was just curious how you or how this experience had changed your religious beliefs. It actually confirmed more of what I believed. It, it brought to light and made me sure a lot of people say that you should have gone and, and seen the Lord, and I have. So I already knew that he exists. Um, I have a very close experience with that up in the what we call the firmament. And so I knew that already. So maybe him knowing that I already knew that allowed me to experience this mechanical thing where they were taking my spirit in the soul trap loop. Uh, which also exists. Um, but I already believed in that as well. Isn't that interesting? Because I, I already knew about it. Well, how do you put the two together? You know, having a God and then God allowing this soul trap to exist. That's the interesting part there is um, God is definitely above the earth watching everyone. But at the same time, it's like... Um, we volunteered to come here and maybe even chose our plan and our life or wanted to experience things. Uh, a lot of people say that, or maybe we were just shown what our life was going to be and we were forced. I don't know, but I don't really have a command on that as far as any experience, but I do believe that um, this life is, is a test of sorts and you see what you can do and maybe you chose to be here and, and it's terrible to think for people that suffer horrible tragedies and calamities here. Well, do you think that we can get out of the trap? I think so. I think this was one of the cues for me was that um, if you know about the soul trap, then you can leave the soul trap is my belief now. Because if, um, If I had an experience where I went through all of the different layers of vibration of each planetary level until I got to the firmament, and I went through the waters above, like it describes in Genesis, 
um, which makes me wonder why, um, if you know where the heaven is or the higher vibration levels you're trying to get to, why would you want to come back here? Why would you want to experience uh, maybe even different lives as a different person in, in different times and or even change genders if you wanted to. I don't know if you can. But um, when, if you know about uh, reincarnation as a soul trap, then you can opt out of it, I think. And you can just, if you know where heaven is, you just head that way. And don't, don't, I would want to get out of that line or that queue that I was in going to, I thought it was going to the moon something to do with the moon cycle and reincarnation. When you use the word trap, it has such a negative meaning. Possibly it's just that we need to keep repeating until we've reached some spiritual level and then we can leave. Oh, you mean through different lives until we get to a certain level? Right. Is it something like that? Or is it a trap like to use this for energy or are we prisoners here for doing bad deeds across the galaxy all of the above right <laughs> but i think that uh, you know i'm of course aware of the luciferian system you know keep them poor short lives use their energy the vampires you know the elites but at the same time maybe we have to keep going through these lives until we figure it out or maybe this is uh, we've all been doing this for thousands of years or longer and this is the time to break out because the knowledge is here in front of it. we're sharing like right now doing this podcast and I'm not the only one. There's thousands and millions of people sharing stories of what's happened to them and what they've seen on the other side. And a lot of this experiences, even though they're different, they share a lot of same basic principles, you know, that you recognize. Do you feel that this realm is some type of simulation? I've heard that said, what does that mean a simulation? It would be a similitude of something else. Oh, well, do you think it's just a made-up world, some kind of constructed place, you know? Right. That's obviously true, you know, as far as when you study the element chart, periodic chart, and you look at the atomic mass of things, and the the neutrons and protons and electrons floating in a atom with quarks and gluons and all that stuff is they're further apart than the planets in our galaxy, you know, so that there's a lot more space than there is solid. And the only thing that makes us solid is the vibration and the speed with which our molecules are uh, running around each other. So if it all stopped and you just unplug the machine, isn't that odd? You know, I believe like if our earthly force comes from the planet Sirius, if it just stopped the beam, we would just fade away. Just like you change FM radio stations, you just turn the dial and it disappears. Do you feel like those beings that sent you back are ETs? I feel like they are um, extraterrestrial would be. They could be from within other realms that are on Earth or near Earth or near our known Earth. Or within our seven planets under the firmament within the waters but not from stars far away i don't think they're from stars far away at this point what are your thoughts about when you have to go back like what are you going to do once this body dies once this body dies i'm going to do what i did in a, a prior experience i had in 85 where i went and was taken to a place that we would call paradise. Um, but you have to go through the planets to get there. If that makes sense. Have you ever heard that before? Has anyone said that? I don't think so. Can you tell us about that experience? Sure. I was a missionary. I was a Mormon missionary in Argentina. I was in Cordoba. Actually, I went to La Falda, Cordoba, to the Eichhorn Hotel where Hitler allegedly stayed with Eva. And I, I taught... I chore grandchildren and took them to Sunday school. <laughs> and they told me, yeah, the Hitler came and visited, stayed with my grandpa. This was in 84, my great grandpa. And um, 
I told the other elder when he came back, I said, these kids are saying that Hitler visited their grandpa. And, the whole, and they go, oh, yeah. He goes, the whole town knows that. Wow. But So when I was in a, a discussion with a family, we were teaching them in their kitchen, in their house, these flip chart discussions. This is in 85. And um, as we were teaching them, we had given them a challenge to read the Book of Mormon so they would know it's true and they would get a burning in their heart. You know, they would tell them the Lord was answering them. So we prayed for them and then my companion and I would pray for them. And let me get a sip here. So we would challenge these people and say, you know, if you pray and read it and pray, then you'll know and then you'll ask us and we'll baptize you. And the requirement was they had to attend church twice before we could baptize them. Um, so we were in process with them. They'd already come to church, but to get to it, my, I had given the first half of the discussion to the family. And then the, there was the father sitting on my left and the mother, the baby on her lap and the, uh, a daughter, son, and the other daughter. There were seven people in my room, in this room, including myself and my companion. And then, um, I had my hands like this. And I'd handed over the flip chart to my partner, and then he was giving his half of the discussion. And I was looking over my hands at this lace tablecloth in the center of the dining room table. And um, all of a sudden, my body just charged up. just, And it got so intense, it just kept going higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. And higher, and higher, and higher, and higher. Until my body was buzzing so hard that... Uh, I felt like if I moved a muscle, just my even my pinky muscles like that, I would just just explode and knock this cinder block house over, you know. And I was afraid to move, and I couldn't control the energy. And uh, then I heard a pop. It was like a soap bubble, like yeah, you know, just pop. And I was out of my body, and I was above the house, like thirty. 40 feet above the kitchen table, but I could see right through the roof. But, and I looked off into space and I could see over a Cordoba in the town I was in. And uh, I looked out and I saw what looked like the moon. I think it was the moon. And I, I went out and I just took off flying and I flew around it. And then there was another planetary body. I, I couldn't identify them. This is the odd part. And I I flew around it in the opposite direction, kind of I made like a figure eight loop. And then I flew through another at some point I flew through some asteroids around them. I was flying around them. And then I went faster. And then something told me, my spirit uh told my spirit or something was telling my spirit, you go through them, you don't go around them. You go through, and I kept speeding up. I kept going faster and faster and faster. So it's each after I got out of the asteroid field, then there was uh, planets coming, and I went through it. At first, I wanted to dodge that one, and then I I sped up and I got like willful intent, and I just went right through it. It sounds odd to tell the story because I'm trying to remember back. Um, so then I remember seeing, I know what was Jupiter, because there was one that was super huge. And then I went through the sun. I went through, um, it was about seven of them. And then I, but by this time I'm going so fast, I'm just cruising along in a straight line. You know how when you drive in a car really fast in a straight line, like on the highway, your vision starts getting narrower and narrower and you're just looking at a pinpoint on the road. And as I started to go faster, um, there were no more planets or anything in front of me, and I was just out in space. And then suddenly things started to turn white at this pinpoint, and it just the whiteness took over the blackness, and it just uh, everything was painted this brilliant, brilliant uh, light, celestial light color, white color. And uh, I came out, I wound up over a floor that was kind of a cloudy floor 
It was exactly the way they depict it in some of the movies where these people are walking around the floor is cloudy, and uh, which is odd, but it, it was exactly that. And the, um, but I was in a, my body, but I was drifting over this floor, but I was going straight ahead. Um, I could see in all directions um, the this planet underneath me or this world that was all these continents and waters and other continents outside of our known continents. I didn't know I was looking at Earth, but I thought um, I'm about to see God. But um, I just went, I saw two beings on the horizon of light in front of me. And I went off and uh, started approaching them. And I went right up to them. And I went up to the being on my left. And he said, what is it that you want? And I said, uh, did you answer them? It was in Spanish. He, he goes, ¿Qué es lo que quieres? And I said, ¿Qué lo contestes? A la familia. And then he said, ¿Por qué? And I said, I said, just look at them. You know, and I, I waved my arm over the floor and this cloudy part parted. And you could see through the floor and we were looking right in the kitchen. I could see myself and my partner and the father and the mother and the kids standing around. And um, I remember thinking while I'm looking down, um, he said, why? And I'm thinking, why do we baptize? Um, what is baptism? And I thought, as missionaries, we want to go around and dunk everybody, you know, and just get numbers. Like, how many people do you baptize on your mission? You know, not that it's supposed to be important, but everybody wants to know, you know, is your, was your mission a high baptizing mission, Elder Royce? You know, and then they would say, uh, but anyway, they, why is it that the Lord just said, why? So that, that always bothered me after that, right? That was right when this experience was over. As soon as I thought, why do we baptize and what is baptism? What's the origin of it and why do we do it? And I hadn't looked back up. I was looking through the, down through the floor. But um, right then, I was right back in my body and I was looking over my fingers. And I realized like, oh my gosh. And I looked around the table at the children and none of them were staring at me. And I could see my companion giving his part of the discussion and the father and everybody, they were all looking at him. Nobody knew I was gone. It was just a quick little experience that changed my life. But the thing was, I couldn't share it. You would think I would want to call my mission president and say, hey, I think I met maybe God or angels, you know, and the Lord. And they, um, but I couldn't tell them because the answer was why you want to baptize these people? Why? You know, like apathetic to the concept of baptism. Have you ever discovered the reason for baptism? Yes. What is it? Yeah, that it took me a couple of decades, but um, I realized baptism was initiated when Astarte, who was um, the empress over Sumeria, she had a son and his name was Tammuz. Um, I know the names change within cultures and don't strike me if I'm wrong, if people in the comments, but basically it's the, the, uh, the queen had a son, you know, the story, right? The, I, the, I don't actually. Oh, you don't. Mm -mm. It's called the, um, it's basically known. I'll use the, the profane term is the whore of Babylon and her son. Um, but this is where the Babylon, Babylonian rituals came from. This is where the um, ideas of sacrifice and um, blood sacrifice, atonement, uh, paying for sins with blood. Um, this is where it all came from. This is the origin of everything that way. And in different continents and different millennia in different cultures, it's been practiced throughout the world. And I think uh, Christianity is just the latest version because you have, um, you pay for sins, you drink the blood and you eat flesh to pay for sins. Um, 
you die and you resurrect after three days. Well, the empress, when her, she married her son, her, her husband was killed. She married her son. Then the son was killed. And then on the third day, on December 22nd, then on the 25th, on winter solstice, uh, those three days when the sun stops, it's before it's returned to the north. Um, she said that her son had resurrected and went to the sun and became the sun god. So that's the whole origin of the sun god religion is through those three days. And to represent that, you baptize someone and they, when they're placed, some would do it with a, a font full of blood. Sometimes it was water, sometimes it's blood. But they would baptize the person and when they come out, uh, that represents the death and the resurrection of the the son of the emperor, empress, who became the sun god. So you basically also known as Baal or Baal. Uh, so yeah, basically that's why when the uh, when the Palestinians or the Hebrews or the uh, people that were over in Babylon for seventy years under Nebuchadnezzar, when that reign ended, they walked back to Palestine as. Uh, and started the religion again, but they started the one for the Christians and call it Christianity. But it was based on what they had learned when they were in Babylon. And it was with the things I mentioned. So you kind of, or may have experienced ETs during your NDE. Have you had any other ET experiences? Yes, I did. I had, um, now this I only found out about five years ago. Uh, maybe five and a half years ago, six years. But um, I was living in uh, Clear Lake near the Space Center. My dad worked at NASA. He actually worked in Mission Control. And I was there when he passed away. And then my mother was in a nursing home. But I was cooking for her before she went in. And anyway, that was where I took a sabbatical for my career and was taking care of my parents. So I would go over to my mom's house and I was buying her groceries and cooking for her. And I was living in her condo. She had remarried and was married this man that already had a four bedroom house, but it was just down the road, two miles away. So she was like, while you're here, go stay in my condo. So I would wake up one morning and I would see these aliens faces, like looking at me through a, a window. And I would think, what was that? You know, but it looked familiar and it kept happening. So then, um, and I remembered some other scenes, uh, like I had had contact with some aliens. So I asked my mother one time and I was sitting in a chair by her bed and we were watching a Hallmark movie and I hit the mattress. And I'm like, Hey mom, 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 wait, wait, hit pause, hit pause, hit pause. She goes, what? <laughs> and I said, uh, did I ever talk about aliens when I was a little kid? Like, that I had friends that came and visited me and took me on a ride or, um, you know, and they, they came and got me or whatever. And, and she just thought back for a second. And she goes, yeah, she goes, um, they were out in the front in the East yard up front. And <laughs> I just went, what? She exactly pointed to where they were in my memory that where the craft landed. So what had happened, I remember I was in my room. It was probably around midnight or late. Um, I was, I think I was playing with a truck on my floor of my room. I was about six years old and they called me. They called me by name and they had, I went to the window and they were standing there. This has kind of come to me back in patches over time. Um, but I think there were six of them and then three left because I have a glimpse of there were two crafts in my yard and three of them boarded one of them and it took off. And then my mother and I walked out and we went into one of them. But actually, she stayed on the grass and I was in there by myself. What did they look like? They were your typical gray aliens that people describe. Just like... Um, you know, I also know somebody who was my bishop at a church. He was at Roswell, and he was one of the MPs that saw the two of the dead ones laying on a blanket outside the craft and um, was told to go guard the perimeter. 
but he got a good look at them toe to toe and he described them and they look like that they're not that hard to look at when you are used to them if they're being nice i guess but these had suits on kind of a shimmery suit um tight fitting i don't remember what they had on for shoes because um they might have been trying to project something because I remember these big black uh, clowny looking shoes and thinking their shoes looked funny or their feet looked funny. But I can't remember exactly what their feet looked like. But I remember uh, I told them when they said, come outside with us, I said, I'm not going out there without my mom. And my. So they went and they woke up my mom. My mom says she was just laying in bed and she suddenly knew there were these grays out in the front yard and she needed to go out there but she doesn't remember how she got from there to the front yard. But then I remember seeing her walking by my window in her nightgown and she went over to the craft and um, she actually took off, came back, she came back in the house and she came to my room and she said, Hey, Philip, come with me. I want you to meet somebody. And so I took, took me by the hand and walked me out there. I already knew where we were going. Cause I watched her. Even when she was in the front yard, she even looked at me. She was like, I'll be right back you know, when she went with them. But they, um, that's where I just remember going up this ramp in and I turned right. And I remembered what I thought were screens, like flat screens around that I was looking at. Um, and that's as far as it got. I did have a memory that came back of where I held like this wand thing with buttons on it. And I think they may have used that to erase my memory for 50 years, you know. But um, I actually went to a hypnotist um, a couple of years ago. That's a friend of mine I went to high school with, but she's now trained by the Edgar Casey group. And she, we set up, uh, her husband set up a camera on a tripod and we've got this on film where she had me under and she was successful. She got me back on the ship on board. And I was, it's not like remembering you're actually in the same moment again. It's live. And this being the one, the leader of them, he was standing on my right shoulder. I was six years old and he was just slightly taller than I was. And the other two, let's call them the minions, they were on the left side. And so, um, but I was the one sitting at the controls. And I remember I just went, ah, I said, I'm sitting at the controls. And I had my hands up like this. And I remember sliders. They had these, uh, controllers that look like sliders you have on your computer now but there were symbols and they did different things as far as like creating the torus around the craft to create like the the field and which direction you're going or how to but somehow you control it um, with your mental power by putting your two hands on this plate rectangular plate but when you look out what i thought were flat screens were actually uh you're looking through the craft that um, it's transparent when you get to a certain frequency or something like that. But we flew out across like Gulf of Mexico into far off places. And I saw buildings that looked not like what we have here. What did the crafts look like? They were saucer shaped. They were, uh, they were round as far as, I don't know if they were perfectly round, but they appeared to be, they had different colored lights underneath. Uh, they were flashing, but they had, uh, I can't remember if they had three legs or four legs. There were, um, I don't remember a door or anything on hinges. I don't know how they open up, but they, the, it looks a lot bigger on the inside when you're on the inside than the outside and you don't feel any inertia. So they're, they're silver but they can appear dark and black, but um, it's very typical to what you see and what, what's told by everybody, what you see in the photos and artwork. Do you think the aliens chose you because of your father's association with NASA? Um, he did better than that. He actually worked at Wright-Patterson and he was in the Air Force after the Korean War and he was working at Wright-Patterson and up until when he married my mother, he was working with a company that specialized in vibration analysis out of Dayton, Ohio and sales. And that was the job he had when this happened to me. 
So I think it had more to do with what he did at Wright-Patterson. Later on in life, uh, when he was older, he had dementia, and I asked him what he did at Wright-Patterson, and he couldn't remember. Phil, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Sure. Through what medium? Do you mean by email or? Whatever you prefer, email, Facebook, some kind of messenger. Well, let's just comment below in this podcast. That'd be fine, I guess. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? This life we're here for is to learn, learn all that we can learn and pick up knowledge. Like you were saying, how would we get out of the soul trap? If there's a soul trap, it's, um, if you know about it, then you'll know how to beat it. Um, if you know what the true cosmology is and um, where heaven is, that'll help you get there. Um, you, your body lives on even after death. Don't be afraid of dying. Um, just be kind to other people. Love one another. Um, be constructive. And always be seeking. You can pray, meditate. There is a God. There is a Lord. Um, I just don't necessarily uh, believe in the different creations of different religions. But um, as far as a positive message, that's about it. Phil, thank you for that positive message. And thank you for sharing your extraordinary experiences with us. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for your podcast. I watch it. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.